The following program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Andrew Womack Ministries. On this special edition of Gospel Truth, we pull back the curtain and show you how God took an unlikely college dropout and made him a Bible teacher with a platform to the world. On yesterday's program, we covered Andrew's life from his March 23, 1968 revelation of God's love and grace to the dark night of the soul he experienced during the Vietnam War. I woke up one morning, and I don't know how to describe this, but it was like God died. It was just, there was no consciousness, no awareness of God, and I freaked out. I honestly did. Join us now as we continue spanning 50 years of God's intervention in the life and ministry of Andrew Womack. For three days, I was without any awareness of God's presence. And I mean, I literally had people walk in the bunker and I remember getting in a closet. We had a little tiny makeshift closet that we had built and I covered myself with clothes so that nobody could see me because I couldn't stand to look at anybody. I was absolutely petrified, wondering, God, what's happened? And I begged and pleaded for three days for whatever had happened, you know, to change, and then I'd get back to normal. And so on the third morning, I was sleeping on this army cot, and I woke up, and I was just kneeling beside the cot praying. And nothing special, but I was just back to normal. I felt normal. I felt like, you know, God's back on the throne. Everything's good. And I didn't understand it at the time, but I really believed that what was happening was I was wanting something special instead of just God being with me and never forsaking me. And so God just took the awareness of His presence away from me for three and a half days. And man, uh, you know, I think that's going to be what hell is like. I think hell is not only going to be the torment of all of this stuff, but there's going to be nothing good no, nothing, God, you're going to be totally isolated. It's terrible, and I tasted that. And, you know, after that, I quit begging for God to come and touch me. I said, man, God, I'm, I'm very happy with where I am right here. And it totally changed my outlook on stuff. It was a really significant experience. And you aren't always going to feel God. You're going to have different feelings, but the Word is consistent. And if I hadn't have gone beyond just that experience and gotten into the Word, I would have crashed and burned. It would not have lasted me through everything I've gone through. God used him in, in his own way over there, gave him time to study the Bible, and look what he is now. He knows the Bible. When I went into Vietnam, I was a Baptist. And when I came out, I wasn't. But after 13 months, actually 19 months in the Army, 13 months in Vietnam, doing nothing but just seeking the Lord and having personal relationship with Him, I was different when I came out. Surviving extreme assaults on his faith and repeated wartime bombardments, Andrew returned home without a trace of PTSD. The Word of God had preserved him, and now the Bible became his life, his food, and his total focus. He began teaching without compromise everything he found in Scripture. Andrew came back from serving in the military. He, um, he became a Sunday school teacher at a Baptist church in, in Garland. Uh, that was a huge thing for all of us. We were high school kids and, and the draft was still on and nobody wanted to go in the draft and here was this man that was older than we were that had been and come back. He had a spiritual life that uh, was obvious. He was real, he was genuine, and we knew that uh, it affected his life in a real way. So it affected our lives as well. I, I'd never met anyone who actually seemed to have the knowledge of the scripture that he had, uh, even just knowing chapter and verse. He was studying the Word all the time, and he, he was bringing that understanding to us in ways that for us were very, very fresh and very life-giving. This is what Jesus said in John chapter 15, if you abide in me and my Word abides in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. 
God's Word has to literally become part and parcel of you. It has to get to where God's Word is a standard whereby you evaluate every action, every desire, everything in your life is controlled by God's Word. If you aren't committed to it that way, then you're in this category that he's talking about, and afflictions and persecutions will steal away the Word, and it'll keep it from being effective. I received my draft notice, and of course, Andrew had already been to, to Vietnam, been in the Army, spent his time and it was kind of a devastating experience for me. And, uh, you know, uh, I, and I remember, you know, talking to Andrew. And Andrew said, hey, you just need to come. I had to, to be there during the summer because I wasn't going in until August. And so I spent the summer uh, with, uh, with Andy. And I, and I lived with him. And I lived in his house. Every day, all day, we talked about Scripture. If we weren't listening to some minister on the radio, um, then we were, we were talking about Scripture. And uh, it was preparing me for what I was going to have to face. And he told me, he said, it's going to be a difficult experience, David. Army's not going to be easy. And he said, you're going to be tempted on the left and right. And he said, to make it through that is, is difficult. When, when Andrew was a Sunday school teacher at Chandler Drive, we had, set, we had several Bible studies. I remember we would have a Bible study, I believe it was Monday nights, um, at his home, at his mother's house. And I believe it started out in the living room and then they, uh, they fixed up the garage to be a room for a Bible study room. <laughs> and, and it just grew to a huge ministry and a very active ministry. Uh, and all the, the time, we, we were getting more than just basic Bible study. We were getting in-depth Bible study. I went by his house and there was a party, I think, maybe a birthday party. I just broke right in, just like, because I knew him. When he walked in, boy, my mother, my sister, a lot of people got upset that he even showed up. And he just came in and took over the whole thing and preached on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. And he says, this is what you received at Saturday night. You just need to go ahead and speak in tongues. And I think he thought I was crazy. And I know the people there thought I was crazy. And boy, he, he got basically booted out of the house. But I stood up and I said, you know what? I believe that that's true. You came over to my house one day. You said, God sent me over here to get you speaking in tongues today. And I said, I'm ready. So you talked to me, you explained it, and then you said, I want you to repeat after me. And I said, Joe, I'm not going to repeat after you. And he said, look, if I said, como esta usted, and you said that after me, would you be speaking Spanish? And I said, well, yeah, but that's different. I said, I don't want to copy your tongue. And you said, you just speak after me. And anyway, you badgered me until finally I started trying to copy what you were saying, speaking in tongues, and it wasn't even close. It was just totally weird. And I got so embarrassed. I said, that's not it. And he said, but you said, but it's not English, is it? And I said, no, but it's not tongues either. And you finally said, you're impossible, and you left. What that did, it like broke a barrier. I had been embarrassed to, I'd been afraid and embarrassed to say something, you know, that you didn't understand. And when I did that in front of him, even though I didn't feel like it was the real deal, it just brought me to a level of humiliation where like, what have I got to lose? And so on the way over to minister to this guy for about 20 something minutes, I just started saying all kinds of things and I didn't feel like it was really speaking in tongues. But there were two words I said that for some reason, I thought that was the Holy Ghost. I felt really good about those two words. So I went in and ministered to this guy, and I mean it was better than I had ever done before. God quickened scriptures to me. I had words of knowledge and wisdom for this guy, and I came out of there thinking it's because I said those two words in tongues. So I said, I'm going to do it again, and I'd forgotten what they were. <laughs> so I panicked. And I thought, oh God, I've been searching for this for years now. And I said, I can't lose this. So as I was driving back across town, I just started speaking in words again. And finally, I had two more words that I felt really good about. And I thought, well, if I could do that, I could get two more. And I, within five or 10 minutes, I was praying in tongues fluently. And I mean, it was just powerful. Several of us would, uh, young people, would go to Andy's house for 
prayer meetings in the morning. But as time went on, people began to drop out and, uh, and then it was me and Jamie and Andy. <laughs> I wondered why everybody quit. I did too. We were just so naive, we didn't know what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> After a while, uh, there were times when, when I, I decided I wasn't going to go for prayer meeting and Jamie said, oh yes, <laughs> I need you to go <laughs> because it wasn't going to be appropriate for her to go by, by herself. After we got married, I think it was her best friend that said, well, the reason yeah. we quit coming is because we could tell what God was doing. But I remember that one morning, this is, God had been drawing me towards Jamie and I thought, is this the Lord wanting us to get together? Does he want me to marry Jamie? So I asked Jamie this question about, has the Lord been dealing with you about anything? I figured if uh, he wanted us to get together, he'd have to speak to Jamie as well as me. And so your response was? I said, he has been dealing with me about something, but I don't know what it is yet. All right. Now, she, she makes a big point out of that. But the well, way that I took it was, well, no, it, it's no big deal. She doesn't know what it is, and so this couldn't be the Lord. And yeah. so I just took that the as, way well, I was saying this is, is, couldn't I'm be God. seeking the Lord, though, because he is dealing with me about something. Anyway, so then I went to the Lord, and I said, Tell, just tell me what's going on with it. Because I, I felt, I think I felt the, it needed, something needed to happen. And that he told me that he was going to be my husband. And so finally, Jamie came to me one night after one of our Bible studies. She stayed over after one of these Monday night Bible studies. And we were in my mother's garage. I remember right mm -hmm. where it was. I know where it was. And she said, you, been, you asked me if the Lord had been dealing with me about anything. And she says, I didn't know at the time, but she says... I've been praying about it, and the Lord told me that we are supposed to get married. And so anyway, I just, <laughs> I didn't know what to say, but I said, you know what, if that's God, I said, we'll do it. I said, I'll have to pray about it. So when we got engaged, he was on the Bible study, and all of a sudden, all, and talk about the girls then, of course, but they weren't close friends to me, but a lot of them left. Bible yeah, my study. Bible my study went from 100 down to 50 is <laughs> when we announced we were getting married. So that ended that. that was funny. Found out they weren't seeking the Lord no, as much as I thought. No, they weren't seeking the Lord too much. <laughs> and then we had the ceremony, and it, it was real good. We both got real blessed from that. And then we had the Hallelujah Chorus for the recessional, and when we marched in, we had um, all how the power of Jesus' name, and it was a good service. I don't know what my parents thought about it. They said it was good, but my dad was getting kind of tired of all the singing. <laughs> when he came, I told him to come out after the sermon, you know, and walk me in, and he had to say something about it, but that was all right. Well, we went up to Canyon City and uh, got there on Sunday night after our wedding, and Marion was in a revival up there, and so we went and stayed with Marion that night, you know, and talked with him a while and went to his revival. And he was really something. Boy, the church was dead. And it was a real cold church. And Marion got up and started singing and, and then started preaching. And I said hallelujah and praise the Lord three or four times real loud. And boy, I mean, it was something else. Marion had to make an apology for me. And, and it was just something to see the service the way that they were. So our honeymoon was in Colorado, but we hit a revival. With Marion Warren, City. the guy who was in that prayer meeting. Yeah. Okay. Andrew and Jamie were married on October 27, 1972. It marked a new chapter in Andrew's life, but one that began with a random act of kindness, something he regrets to this day. This is one of my big mistakes. Well, one of the worst things I've ever done. You took what money? you had, and he wanted to go totally out of faith, so we gave thousands away. I had. So we, so we would get down to zero and live by faith. I had. That's one of the things I would say, never do. Yeah. Wisdom when we got back from our wisdom. honeymoon, I had $5,000 left in my savings, and I turned them all into $100 bills and gave them out at 7-Elevens, just to total strangers, just so that we could be out on faith. Oh, it's dumb. Yeah. 
things happened in the Baptist church after uh, Andrew had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and subsequently uh, I had, um, we began to feel just more and more um, sort of ostracized from the church and not welcome. Finally, one day it was so bad, I was sitting there praying in tongues quietly with my finger on the verse that says, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies himself. That's the only way I could last through that church service. And I was praying and all of a sudden the Lord just brought to my memory the scripture that says, cease my son to hear the words that, in, that cause you to err from the words of knowledge, the instruction that causes you to err from the words of knowledge. And boy, that day, I said, that's it. I said, this is my last time at that church. And Jamie and I left and we went out to eat. I think that was, we went out to eat with Marshall and Cindy Townsley. And at lunch, we just told them, that's it. We're out of here. We'll never come back to this church. I'm not going to listen to this anymore. And I can remember we didn't hesitate. We said, well, wherever you're, you're going to go, we're going to go with you. And that's what we did. That's when... Did we go live with your... I, we that's with your we went and lived with my mother for six months, that's Marshall awesome. and Cindy and Jamie and me. And I've often wondered, why did she let two strange teenagers, because we were teenagers late, you know, almost 20 when we got married, uh, live in her house. And it was the summer of the Watergate hearings. And so in the nation, Things were blowing up. We were, we were literally watching uh, trials on TV with, uh, about the president. She was kind of in that last days mindset and end times mindset. And so she was kind of stocking food away in the house. And uh, it consisted of tuna fish mostly, I think, and some other things. And so Marshall and Cindy and Jamie and I ate her entire seven-year <laughs> supply of food, <laughs> tuna fish, for it breakfast, lunch, and supper. We wiped that her was out. Yeah. It was really fun. There were times where we would actually uh, ask her to go to church with us somewhere, and she wouldn't go. And Andy and I would actually carry her bodily, at laughing. She was laughing so hard saying, no, I don't want to go to a meeting. And, and Andrew saying, yes, you do. Yes, you do. And they would bodily pick up this very dignified woman and carry her out and put her in the back seat of her own car. And she would go with us and she would enjoy it. So we lived with her for six months and mooched off of her, which, you know, is not the right thing to do. But again, we didn't know what to do. And I remember that I would spend all day long just praying in tongues and God, Give me an opportunity to minister the Word somewhere. We were really just seeking God. We didn't know where to go with our life, what to do. We didn't have any money. It, we weren't lazy. We were just really wanting to serve God and please God and make sure we were doing everything we could. We were looking for every, uh, every avenue to get that uh, message out. And so uh, Andrew would, would go anywhere that he was given an opportunity to teach. Of course, we would go with him. Um, they, they were doing youth camps and Bible studies and all kinds of things. And so within a short period of time, they, we moved to Seagaville and started ministering in this little Bible study. And uh, I called it a Bible study and eventually they came to me. We, we never had more than probably three, four, five people show up, but they came to me and they said, this is our church. And I said, well, I'm not a pastor. They said, you can call yourself whatever you want. It says, we've all been kicked out of our church. This is our church. And so I became a pastor by defecto. Yep, that's the same place. This is the same place. Not much has changed. The floor looks about the same as it did. Over on that side, there was no floor. We used to have a foosball machine and a pool table in there and electrical spools that had wine bottles with candles in them. That's what we used for light. And we didn't have enough money to keep the electricity going, so 
they turned off the electricity and we would get in there and just pray and the Lord would heat this thing up even in the winter and it would be okay when we were in there worshiping the Lord. I don't know, most of the things that we saw happen in Sigaville didn't happen in the church. Not many people came to the church. So the church was just basically a Bible study. All we did was study the Word and we prayed and that's where we learned how to operate in the gifts of the Spirit and give messages in tongues and interpret. You know, I know we saw uh, people who were deaf here. Um, I know we saw people who were either completely blind or severely uh, blinded um, come seeing. Um, there were times where words of knowledge and words of wisdom were just flowing and with it healing. These were very hard financial days for the four of us. When, when I look back on it, I, I just can't believe how, how little any of the four of us had uh, financially. And yet we weren't, we didn't live disturbed by that. We just lived kind of day to day. We never let, and he taught me this, I live by it still today. We, we never let circumstances interpret Scripture for us. We always let Scripture interpret our circumstance. And I had people offer me jobs, and I said, no, God's called me to the ministry. And I was under the impression that if I worked a job, I wouldn't be doing what God told me to do. So we went through really, really hard times. But I, I remember going in places and ministering with them, and then we'd come out and re, you know the, we'd have an offering, and the offering would be five dollars, and so we'd go put gas in the car to drive a little bit of gas to drive home and buy one hamburger and cut it in a quarter, quarters, and all of us got a quarter and ate that hamburger on our way home. We actually went to a service where a man was teaching on prosperity. And I mean, the things he was saying was exactly what we needed. And I remember going back and looking at those tapes and man, they could have changed our life and we couldn't buy one of them. And I looked up at Jamie and she had tears in her eyes. She was eight months pregnant, had gone two weeks without eating. And she never complained. She never said a word. We had spent all the money we had to get to the meeting and we had, we, we were so hungry for the truth that was on those cassettes or in those books, but we couldn't buy any of them. We would just walk around the tables, almost drooling on, on this resource that we knew contained more truth of the Word of God, but we couldn't have any of it. That's when I made a decision. I said, Father, if you ever give me anything, that'll help another person. I'll never deny them access to it because of finances. And that's when I made a decision to give things away. And I didn't even know at that time that I'd ever have anything to give away. So I didn't understand what I was saying, but I made that commitment. And when we finally started putting out teaching materials when we were in Childress, uh, I started making them free just because of that commitment I made to the Lord. He, you know, he talks some about Joshua when Joshua was a young, his oldest boy, when he was a young, a toddler, and he got very, very sick. And um, I watched Andrew suffer uh, in, that, in that moment during that short, short season. I know it felt like forever at the time, but it really was a short period of time that Joshua was sick. But he was a child, and he was helpless, and Andy and Jamie were doing everything they could to help, and Andrew had prayed, and, and we had been praying for Joshua. And, and yet we hadn't seen results. And then I saw Andrew really dip. It's the first time I saw him just sort of waver. And I understand it. I, I perfectly understand it, having children of my own. But he, he really, it's the first time I saw him waver uh, over something. And I, I stepped into that situation with him. And he says I rebuked him. I really was trying to encourage him to take a stand on the very things that he had taught us and that helped us so much, through so much. And he responded to it, and I saw him. He, it's like he just, the light came back on. He kind of got back up on the inside. He made that decision again that Satan was not going to win this one and his boy was not gonna suffer needlessly any longer. 
And I think shortly after that is when they had a breakthrough for Joshua. I was rocking Joshua to sleep, and God <laughs> spoke that to me. That was for a prophecy. Your Jewish roots coming out there. <laughs> yeah. Join us tomorrow as we continue to go behind the scenes, revealing the powerful intention of God in Andrew's life and ministry. Andrew Womack, congratulations on 50 years of ministry. How amazing is that? We're proud of you, and I know you've got lots of great years in front of you to continue bringing people the Word of God. Now, there's something I want to say right off of the bat. Now, you listen to it, I got, I'm telling you nothing that's, that, that's new. I understand that. Gloria and Jamie, you know it, and I know it. Neither one of us would have ever made 10 years of ministry without Gloria and Jamie. Praise God, our wives married beneath themselves, brother. Praise God. Thank you for your faithfulness, for your integrity, and for your heart for God and for our heart for His people. You bless so many, and I believe that even the next 50 years are even going to be better. So we're praying for you. We celebrate what God has done, and we thank you for your faithfulness. We hope you've been blessed and inspired watching today's portion of Andrew Womack, 50 Years with the True Gospel. If you'd like to own the entire documentary, be sure to order the special DVD set today for a gift of any amount. The second DVD in this set contains a collection of intriguing bonus scenes we were not able to include in the main story. These bonus features reveal little-known aspects of Andrew's life and ministry, not available anywhere else. You don't want to miss these. This commemorative DVD set is sure to become a collector's item and a lasting treasure to all those who've loved and supported Andrew Womack over the years. And there's more to our 50-year celebration. Throughout this week on our website, we'll be giving away several ministry resources, including a grand prize of an entire library of Andrew's books and products. But go to awmi.net slash anniversary for a full explanation. Our helpline number is 719-635-1111. If the lines are busy, remember you can order ministry materials or become a Grace Partner 24 hours a day, seven days a week at awmi.net. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. I hope that you've enjoyed going back and seeing how God has moved in my life. I tell you, it is awesome. I am so thankful. But there are so many people that God wants to touch just like this. He's no respecter of persons. He will do this for anyone. And you know, I'm reaching as far and as deep with the gospel as I possibly can. And I'd like to ask you today to become a partner with me and to help us to get this gospel out. 